We are now approaching our keynote speech, ASEAN 2015 Challenges and Opportunities, held by Dr. Surin Pitsuwan. We are very honored to have Dr. Pitsuwan with us here today to share some of his experience and insights with us. Uh, Dr. Surin Pitsuwan has, besides extensive experience within ASEAN, also worked as an advisor for major organizations such as the UN, UNESCO, and International Crisis Group. And he is now today working uh, in a think tank called um, Future Innovative Thailand Institute, advising on education, corruption, and economic policy. I am very happy to invite Dr. Surin Pitsuwan to the stage to present. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, please excuse the voice. It's not as sexy as it should be. I'm suffering from an allergy, allergy of uncertainty and instability in Thailand. <laughs> I think it is very fitting that all of you have chosen to be here this morning focusing on issues like human security because on the streets out there I don't think there is much human security. We are going through Thailand and others in the region are going through a process of a major transformation as you are aware of. And that transformation is probably going to be very, very disruptive in a way. And it's going to be constructive in a sense going into the future. Disruptive because many of us will have to adjust to the new emerging environment in the region. Ten economies, 2.5.6 trillion US dollars combined GDP, 600 million people with tremendous differences and diversity among ourselves of 140 billion US dollars a year FDI coming into the region and a lot of influences and a lot of issues exerting upon us from outside. In that sense the region has to adjust quite quick, quite fast the fact that it is the most diversified region of the world is certainly difficult to manage. <coughs> and I'm glad you are picking up on two communities, ASEAN Economic Community, which is very dynamic and will have a far-reaching implications on the region and the socio-cultural community pillar which will be that necessary foundation for the ASEAN community to really be built or be achieved on a solid and strong foundation. <coughs> you have heard a lot about the ASEAN economic community because the private sector is extremely interested and motivated by that concept. ASEAN trades among ourselves and with the world more than what we produce. I give you the figure of 2.5, 2.6 trillion US dollars GDP combined but we trade 
about 2.7, 2.8 trillion US dollars. That figure only includes 25% of ASEAN to ASEAN trade. And that is a very low figure for an economic community to come into being. NAFTA trades among themselves, the three countries, Canada, the US, and Mexico, 68-70%. They trade with the world only 30%. The EU as Ambassador Schultz will testify within 27-28 members they trade about 75% only among and between themselves. They trade with the world only 25%. <coughs> so you see there is that small portion of trade that ASEAN will have to expand, that we will have to increase if we want to be a viable ASEAN economic community. But precisely because of this low figure in the ASEAN to ASEAN trade, to increase it is exactly what Mr. John Brandon said. It will have to be the small guys and small gals working into the landscape, walking into the landscape. And that is, of course, the small and medium-sized enterprises. Just like anywhere else, small and medium-sized enterprises in ASEAN contribute about 60-65% to our GDP. Employment is higher than that, but that is where instability is going to take place as far as employment is concerned, as far as resiliency is concerned, are they going to be able to sustain the onslaught of this major movement of FDI coming into the region? And what will happen to the issue of migrant workers? A country like Thailand is moving up our economic productive scale we are moving from labor intensive to a higher level of technological content in our economic production. Labor costs in Thailand, in Malaysia, in Singapore, in Brunei for that matter, has risen so much that local workforce are no longer interested in, I mean, the, the industries can no longer afford to hire local <coughs> workforce. So migrant workers are now moving on the landscape whether or not ASEAN or member states of ASEAN are ready. And I think Thailand is a good case in point. About 3 million floating on this land came. Maybe only half legal. And maybe less than half protected. And even less than that, fully protected with their rights, with their privileges are being respected. So the issue of this human security or human insecurity is an issue that the ASEAN community, particularly ASEAN socio-cultural community, will have to pay particular attention to. I just came up from the border with Malaysia, General Bachon. There's a city on the frontier called 
that long, just about 40 kilometers from Hatyan. Bustling, growing, dynamic. Most tourists are from Malaysia. Some of them come as far as Singapore, but they are there for services that are not quite legal. Definitely human trafficking is at work along the borders there. And where are, they, where are these people from? Across the border, north of Thailand, west of Thailand, all the way to southern China. The economy is growing, but elements of risk to the people in this economy, whether they are local, whether they are migrants, whether they are foreigners, are very much here on the landscape. Human trafficking is here too. The other issue is how some of these industries in Thailand, construction, Food processing, fishery, how can these industries, major industries in the country, survive without foreign labor? It is tough. Half of the population of Samutsakwan province, where the fishery industry, where the food processing industry, fishery, are located half of the population, over half of the population, are foreigners. If foreigners are taken back, the entire industry is going to crumble. So, the awareness and the realization that these people are the factor of production with their own rights, with their own privileges, with their own welfare must also be built into the business plan. Two years after I arrived at the Secretariat in Jakarta, we were told by WHO Bangkok, we were told by UNICEF Bangkok, that these people in the fishery industry who speak no Thai, who are mostly illegal, have no access to health care because they are illegal, because they are afraid to report themselves. I had to appeal to the Human Security Trust Fund in New York asking for three million US dollars so that they can help these unfortunate people to have access to health care. So the mental attitude, the attitude of the private sector themselves, of the officials themselves, that these people are here to serve a function. They must not be exploited. They must not be taken advantage of. And their health is the health of our own community. Imagine elephantitis. What's that, what's that, what's that called? Elephantitis? The big, the big food? Rok Tao Chang in Thai. Swollen food of people. Malaria. Or AIDS. These are what we call issues without borders, issues and problems that would need no visa or no passport to move cross borders or to affect the rest of the community. That sensitivity has to be built still into our people. So migrant workers are
critical issue, one of the critical issues for us here. Education. You have heard many universities across the landscape are now adjusting their calendar, economic calendar, so that they can be synchronized. So that our young people, our students can move cross border more easily. Indonesians can come here, take courses, be given credit for, move back, Indonesian students come, Thai students go. This is to facilitate. But it is very difficult. We have something what we call the ASEAN University Network, about 30 institutions around the region. It's extremely difficult to bring the standards to the same level recognized by all of them. Something similar to the Bologna system that you have in Europe. It is still at a very, very early stage, but they are now talking, they are now moving. Because without easy flow of people, there is no community. You can talk about the flow of the goods, the flow of the services, access to services. You don't have to move here to use Thai telephone. You can access to it from outside. You don't have to come here to access to the facility or the service of the Thai hospitals. You can access through this from Laos, from Cambodia, from, from Myanmar. So you can access to services. You can facilitate the, the movement of, of goods. But if the people don't move, you don't have a community. That is something that we also have to work on and to enhance that mobility among our people. We don't need visas anymore from each other. It's just how many days the difference. And I think some countries are a bit reluctant. They want to see, they want to know. Some of them would say, yes, guaranteed ASEAN citizens, but upon arrival, you pay some fees because they need the income. But it's not the requirement of the visa. So that is another issue, how to facilitate movement of people. <clears throat> so AEC and so, and ASEAN socio-cultural community are essentially quite, quite, uh, related, very, very much related to each other. We won't have one until we have the other. But you hear less about the ASEAN cultural <coughs> community, partly because only people like you are interested in it. The international NGOs. Not the big powers, not the major powers. They are more interested in political security. They are more interested in economic community. Therefore, you have heard of them more, and probably they have made more progress because there has been influence from outside, or encouragement from outside, or engagement from outside. ASEAN has been forced to move on the political and security agenda. ASEAN has been forced to move on the economic community agenda, but less on the socio-cultural. But it is not any less important, not any less critical. In fact, for the community, ASEAN community, AC, Big C, to emerge and to be strong and to be efficient, to be resilient, definitely the socio-cultural pillar must be addressed or must be strengthened. And I'm glad you are interested and focused on that. But it is no less challenging than the political and security no less challenging than the economic. 
We are not talking about concessions on tariffs. We are not talking about concessions on protectionism. But we are talking about diversity of values. ASEAN socio-cultural community will have to be driven and activated by the people of ASEAN. It took me a lot of effort to convince member states in Jakarta that we need to interact and we need to work with the civil society. This is diversity of value. Some member states said, yes, Mr. Secretary General, you can work with the civil society, but they have to be our civil society, endorsed by the government, endorsed by the officials. And coming from the academic background, coming from a political background, going into that office, it's very difficult for me to accept that definition or to accept that that condition that you work with the civil society but it will have to be our civil society civil society is civil society civil society are noisy civil society are sometimes single issue organizations you work on one issue and you are extremely committed to it and you don't care about any other issues. You are passionate about your issue and you don't accept any limitations and the governments can't tell you that, wait. Because you have that commitment, that passion to that single issues that you have. So it is extremely difficult to bring the people in, to bring the civil society in to bring the NGOs into the process, but without them, very little can be done. ASEAN will have to struggle through this reservation that they have, and this necessity that the civil society will have to be given the space in the process of our community building process. Of all the issues in the in the socio-cultural issues, the challenge of trying to give people safety nets and fundamental rights human rights are also <coughs> difficult. You know of the old debate about Asian values and universal values. Countries in ASEAN, although not all, subscribe to the Asian values approach, those who are not are quite comfortable hiding behind that concept. And there are those who would insist that there are universal values that ASEAN will have to subscribe ourselves to. But because of their own political internal differences and struggles inside, it's very difficult for them to move up to the front and say, yes, we are universalists. I'm talking about countries like Indonesia, like Thailand, like uh, the Philippines, are very much universalists in this debate of Asian and universal values. President Yudhoyono called his democracy, a noisy democracy, and difficult for him to move on that agenda. 
to advance the role of the, the, the civil society, to enhance human rights, to enhance the participation, or to expand the space. Quite difficult, but committed to. Thailand uh, of, I don't know, two or three months. Sometimes, in some situation, Thailand would be extremely universalist. But in some situations, are not quite committed. And this depends on the ups and downs of the political landscape here. I was at ASEAN five years. I worked with five Thai prime ministers. <laughs> and you can't expect that the values, the principles that are, that are used in order to deal with a lot of these problems would be the same. Some have given more emphasis than others on these issues. Some would give less emphasis on these issues, more interested in, in something else. Some just don't have time to pay any attention to any issue. Just come and go, three months, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> the Philippines is extremely universalist. Philippines is extremely committed. Philippines is extremely open. I guess it's the heritage, it's a legacy, and the structure of the society. Rather exposed, rather um, open, American influence, Western oriented in the mentality. Catholic influence, Christian Catholic kind of mentality values make the Philippines more open and more, I guess, Western universalist as far as these things are concerned. Now, the debate certainly has given ASEAN the instability, the, in the discontinuity of moving forward. We have ASEAN Inst Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights, but the emphasis is on promotion, not protection. And the Asian value side, represented by Singapore and Malaysia, would argue that the state provides everything. If there is any need to protect human rights, go to the criminal law. Go to the existing law. There is no need for new mechanism or new regimes to protect or to promote. Human rights protection, human rights pro uh, promotion are being seen as the extension of the patronage of the state. Not the other way around, that they are the rights of the people to demand that the state shall limit its power so that these human rights shall be protected and shall be promoted and shall be pursued by the people. You see the two, the two approaches, the differences. And this certainly has rendered us, this debate has rendered us a bit slow in the development of the human rights protection measures. We're still working on promotion, promotion, and promotion. Because you can't go wrong with promotion. You can't oppose promotion. <laughs> you can't say no to promotion. Yes, go on and promote. When it comes to protection, it's mean that Intergovernmental Commission of Human Rights, ASEAN, 
will have to issue a statement calling upon member states to please take care of that issue because it affects me. The Rohingyas in Myanmar, you must have heard the science of the issue. Southern Thailand, you must have heard a rather deafening silence of the issue. The Buddhists and the Christians in, in Vietnam, you must have heard the silence, very conspicuous silence. Why? Because of this. Oh, it's very controversial. Because open society means free and open. It has a philosophical background. Open society a la how Hoppe. Who believes in the openness of the society for the pursuit of the full potentials of each individual. It's a long debate. <coughs> and Mr. Chuan from here said, leave it to me, I'll bring it up with the leaders. That's when the officials conceded to each other. And here is what the concession is, or the language or the phraseology to replace that open society. <laughs> ASEAN shall be a collection of open societies make them poor. Based on their own historical experiences <laughs> and with respect to their own cultural and social values. Now, you can see you can see the debate there between the Asian values and the universal values. Open society as a concept has been diluted <coughs> and replaced by open societies with conditionalities. In other words, you go on your own. We are not going to have one common vision on issues open society. So this rhythm, this tension is going to go on into the future as we work on the community. When we get to 2015, this issue will still be with us. Why? Because of the differences that still remain in each of the member states in each of the body politics that are composed of ASEAN, that, that composed ASEAN. So, let me say that there is a very strong phrase in the ASEAN Charter, in the ASEAN language, and that is, this is going to be a people-centered organization. There's going to be space for the people. Committed to the principles of democracy and human rights, there shall be diversity of human rights and diversity of human rights standards and diversity of democracies. Let me just say that this pillar is going to become more contested, or this space of socio-cultural ASEAN will become more contested as we move into the future, into the community. Because there will be more investment coming in, because there will be more engagement from abroad, because there will be more 
movement of people into each other landscape and if each member state is not quite clear about what to do how to protect and how to manage the differences among ourselves and in the protection and promotion of the rights and privileges of our own people moving across the landscape and others coming into the landscape. This will continue to be a rather hotly contested terrain, space into the future, the socio-cultural. And as I said, precisely because major powers, dialogue partners are not quite interested in association uh, in the ASEAN socio-cultural community. More on the economic, more on the political and strategic and security. More urgent. There's no impetus to move quicker, faster on the ASEAN socio-cultural community. But that has to be changed. And I'm glad you have taken up that pillar. Because it needs encouragement, it needs infusion of interests into it in order to move, in order for it to move. There's another issue called, in this socio-cultural pillar, environment is considered socio-cultural. Education, health, sports, arts, tourism. Tourism is an economic half, and of course the resources for it, for tourism would be in socio-cultural. But the the socio-cultural community will need a very very focused interest and need the participation and contribution of the people. And the people must be represented by their own representatives, not official, not government. It has to be the civil society and the NGOs. And we have to make that agreement. That when we when we talk about civil society and NGOs, we must deal with them as open, free, civil society and NGOs. Not civil society as an extension of the state. And that will remain a debate into the future. I talk about investment, I talk about 1.4, no, 140 billion US dollars each year coming into ASEAN which means major business, major investment, major enterprises will be coming into ASEAN. Which means the protection of the small people, of the indigenous people, of the minorities, that would face the impact of these major movement of capital and investment will also be an issue. Who to protect them, who to help them, who will assist them, who will argue on their behalf that they too have their rights, traditional rights, land rights. A lot of problems in Indonesia, you will see that. A lot of problems already in the Philippines, you will see that. And a lot of problems in many other countries. That too will be will continue to be issues into the future. A lot of instruments, a lot of regimes already in the international arena. 
but are not quite fully subscribed to. A lot of declarations out there on the rights of minorities, on the rights of indigenous people, the movement of major capital coming in will intensify the debate on the impact to these people. A lot of exploitation will take place if will happen, will occur, if we are not careful about it, who will help them? That's why the states will have to work with the NGOs, but not the NGOs that belong to the state. You know what I mean? It will have to be free and open and independent NGOs so that they know what their problems are. Not from the perspective of the state, but from the perspective of the people. This will also be an issue that every member state will have to face, will have to address. And I hope you will help. I hope you will continue to see a niche for yourself, each and every one of the civil society represented here, that you will see your role, your contribution, still needed in order to help promote a sharing and caring community as we set ourselves to achieve. And I hope you will look at a lot of events, a lot of occurrences on the landscape of ASEAN from this perspective, whether issues in Cambodia, whether it's the issues in Indonesia, Philippines, here, from the perspective of the void, the gap, and the opening of the protection, of the promotion, of the realization that as we built our community, people, interests, people, rights, people, privileges also need to be protected and promoted. We can't go on to the economic community and hoping that there will be trickling down to everyone, that there will be benefits for everyone. If we are not careful about this very issue, ASEAN will be divided in the middle between the rich and the poor, the haves and the haves not. And it's not going to be a community. And I'm glad you are interested in this particular issue. The relationship between economic community and socio-cultural community, ASEAN. Because this will contribute to stability and security at the higher level that political and security community are working on. I wish you luck. Thank you very, very much. probably some questions. So who would like to ask some question, uh, please raise the hand, introduce yourself very briefly. Ambassador. Thank you. Well, Dr. Surin, as always, it was fascinating listening to you. I uh, think ASEAN and Thailand can count themselves happy. Under the leadership of Indonesia, 2011, the leaders have agreed that by the year 2022, don't ask me why, it's just 10 years after 2011, ASEAN aspires to have a common approach to foreign policy, common approach to defense, not defense, strategic and security uh, challenges. Uh, the argument is, we are dealing with the world, we are helping the world, we are assisting the world on a lot of these issues. At one point, any time, there are about 5,000 ASEAN peacekeepers around the world. 
but they are not considered ASEAN. They are individual member state uh, uh, troops or, or contingents. So we aspire to have common foreign policy by the year 2022. Uh, common approach to challenges, political security challenges by 2022. As far as the transfer of sovereignty is concerned, the work is very slow, incremental, and it is a byproduct of the integration process itself. Why am I saying this? Integration certainly forces us to take each other's issues into our interests. Because integration benefits you and integration also exposes you to each other's problems, weaknesses. A community can be a strong community as much as the strength of the weakest member. If that weakest member is very low in whatever it has, that community cannot be stronger than that. That weakest link is going to decide how strong you are. Because it can break. Now, so transfer of sovereignty in your experience, because you have many other things in common. Similarities within the EU membership are much higher than similarities within ASEAN with tremendous diversity as I began my presentation. So you must have heard this phrase of mine, the EU is our inspiration, the EU is not our model. But having said that, this experience of integration has led us from the economic pillar as a matter of fact, has led us to realize that we need to take our interest in each other's affairs across the border. Because without that, integration is not going to work. So at the Secretariat, there is a monitoring office of the macroeconomic management of all ASEAN member states. Now, how intrusive is that office? Sitting in Jakarta, collecting data, information, news, movement of various issues that could have implications on the macro management of the economy of that particular member state. But that also will have implications on the rest because we are integrated. We have found out in 1997-98 that we were more integrated with each other than we thought we were. That's why something happened on the 2nd of July 1997 in Thailand. The next day in Malaysia, the next week Indonesia, the week after in the Philippines. Boom, 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 tom yam, boom. Remember that. Well, if we were not integrated, we would not have been affected. If we were not integrated, we would have been protected and isolated from each other. So, to the extent that they have agreed that there shall be this office in Jakarta is already a concession to that concept that is, let us transfer some portion of power of decision making, or at least of monitoring. And that could be quite intrusive beyond before ASEAN. Now that ASEAN has come into, the spirit of ASEAN has come into being, the vision of ASEAN has come, in, has come into being, you need to talk about those things slowly. The Chiang Mai multilateral, what is that called? Initiative. Right after the crisis in 1997, about 1998, at the end of the year, the Ministers of Finance of ASEAN decided to call a meeting of their deputies and their central bank governors. And they met in Chiang Mai. And along the way, in this discussion, they invited deputy ministers of finance of China, Japan, Korea. 
governors of central banks of China, Japan, Korea, so it's ASEAN plus three, to come together, and it was called the Chiang Mai Initiative. Initially, Thailand would commit itself to help Malaysia if Malaysia is under attack. Currency, we are talking about uh, at the end of last century. Indonesia would commit itself to the Philippines. It's called bilateral swap arrangements. 120 billion US dollars being set aside, committed to help. It's not going to be enough, but at least the country under attack, that need for an exchange would not go immediately to the IMF. There will be a breathing space and also an instrument, a mechanism that would demonstrate that ASEAN knows what it is doing, that ASEAN is committed to help each other, that ASEAN is looking for answers to some of the common problems that we have. We are not going to let one member be exposed and be challenged by this uncertainty in the international community or speculation or short term uh, money, hot money. So we are we arrange some safety net for ourselves. Two years ago they decided 120 billion US dollars is not enough. It's double it, 240 billion US dollars. And and open it up. And that is anybody can those who are interested can come in. India is interested, Australia is interested, and the ASEAN and the plus three countries said, let us consolidate among ourselves first, then we will talk about the admission of India and Australia into the club. But my point is this, they also set up a monitoring office in Singapore. Because each member state commits certain fund into it, Something happened to one of the members, that fund will be drawn down. Use my money. I need to know how you are doing. That's also a concession to the demand of the pooling of the decision making or of the administration of the management rather than purely independent, isolated from each other. The first director came from China. The second director came from Japan. And the third would be opened up among the rest. They will have to compete to go into that office in Singapore. This is a concession, and that's what I said, incremental moving into the direction of pooling of sovereignties. But of course, they won't <coughs> use that phrase. But I can detect, I can feel it that they know what they are doing, that they realize that they cannot be standing in isolation apart from each other, absolutely has nothing to do with each other's internal affairs. After all, it will affect <coughs> them. The management of the forest fire, the smoke, the smog from Sumatra, from uh, Kalimantan, into Singapore, into Malaysia, into Southern <coughs> Thailand, into Brunei also prompt them into a discussion that, look, yes, it's your territory, Indonesia, <coughs> but your problem is our problem. Same as in Northern Thailand, yes, Laos, yes, Cambodia, yes, Myanmar. They are in your territories, but forest fires affect us, our tourism, our health. Let us, slowly, we are working on those functional issues. Not yet on principle, but certainly moving step by step on functional issues that we need to cooperate. So I think this is a good sign. How long will it take? Uh, we don't know. At some point, there might be some critical moment that would speed this thing up, but not yet. Europe is our inspiration, it is not our model. And I can tell you, in secret, we are not thinking about common currency. <laughs> you have not given us much encouragement <laughs> to go into that uh, uh, area at this point. Thank you. Yes? Uh, I am, as my colleague mentioned, uh, 
the other day, you are really fascinating in your speech. Uh, you mentioned the importance of correlation of the uh, economic and the uh, political uh, pillar and the social cultural pillar in ASEAN community. I think uh, it is uh, really uh, fundamentally right and important issues. As uh, I have some experience in European countries, maybe ASEAN, community, ASEAN countries can have benchmarking from your uh, experience and uh, precedences. But I think ASEAN is different and you cannot pick all of them. In this sense, uh, even though you raised some concerns and uh, uh, future uh, issues in these two correlation between uh, economic and uh, polit political pillar and uh, social cultural issues, what I want to hear is, if possible, uh, can you give me some, uh, even though it is very broad and rough, some guideline how you can solve these issues in the future? Hmm have to insist that there is a space for them. Uh, I think we have to educate the governments, <laughs> particularly those governments that are still reluctant to engage uh, the civil society, to engage the NGOs that uh, they can't, like the ambassador said, they can't do it alone. They can't accomplish this task alone. They have to go beyond governments and government officials. Um, the landscape is too huge. 600 million people, uh, bigger than the EU, <laughs> and activities on the ground are going to be quickening, very dynamic. And there will be gaps, there will be holes, there will be loopholes that the states are not going to be able to, to fill them. It's the people. It's the people's organizations and people organizations, local, working with international uh, international uh, NGOs addressing those problems. When we went into Myanmar for the Cyclone Nakis uh, crisis management, the civil society from the international community went in with us. And the governments and international organizations support international civil society to work and to engage local and ASEAN civil society. That was a very, very important turning point for ASEAN to accept the role, the contribution of the civil society from abroad and inside. And it, in fact, I think that opening this is the silver lining on, uh, on the clouds. Cyclone Nakis caused 140,000 lives right away. Devastated communities and infrastructure and livelihood. But Cyclone Nakis also opened a window for civil society inside Myanmar, international civil, civil society, to be connected. And for the first time, we worked together on that issue for two years. The World Bank, the UN, the EU came behind us, ASEAN, rather than working on your own inside because of the peculiar situation of Myanmar. And that Cyclone Marcus crisis elevated the confidence of Myanmar in the international community to the point where it could give impetus to further opening and further implement, further evolution to the point where you see where they are now. The private sector would tell you this, you go into Myanmar, they would say Cyclone Nakis was the beginning. So I think if we pick up issues like this, of course we hope that there won't be more cyclone dark is for us to, to, to be open up to each other. But at least if we can pick up some of those issues and then work our way through and, and try to persuade <coughs> each other that <coughs> civil society, the international civil society have a role to play.
have a contribution to make. Let us not just treat them as anti-establishment, anti-government, anti-anything uh, official. Then I think there is room. And I think there is that developing in, in us. When I went in, I was restrained from meeting with the civil society, as I told you earlier. Indonesia was organizing a human rights forum. This is before Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights ASEAN. I was told by, what do you call, senior officials of ASEAN, meaning the top civil servants in the ASEAN foreign ministries, that I should engage with the civil society working on human rights in Jakarta. And I told them, if you are not ready to engage, give me some space to engage. Because in the Charter, our promise to the people, our commitment to the future is this is going to be a people-oriented organization. And all of you are reluctant. At least give me the space to engage with them. I'm not going to commit you. I can't anyway, because in the end it's consensus. But at least let us open the communication line. So when I was there, or the five years that I was there, pushing the envelope, pushing the parameter, testing the readiness, Sometimes some governments got very annoyed, but so what? That's what they need. And I hope that that will be the trend into the future. That there will be people willing to push the envelope, willing to extend the parameter, expand the space. That there are certain things are seen. This is coming back to you, Pastor. That the Charter recognized the Secretariat as the only entity in the entire ASEAN spectrum that has an ASEAN perspective to pursue. It's the last item of the article of the Secretariat. The rest are particular interests. The rest represent member states, but the Secretariat represents ASEAN, the region, has a regional and ASEAN perspective. That's the language. And I took that very, very seriously. I have a space, a space for myself, because this is an entity that has an ASEAN perspective as its guiding guiding principle. The rest will position, the rest will negotiate, the rest will debate to protect and promote particular interests of member states. But the ASEAN Secretariat has that overall perspective. And based on that last clause in the article on the Secretariat of ASEAN, I push. And we need to push further. I'm glad you are interested in this. <coughs> you must help ASEAN to move on further. Thank you very much.